most important people, Joe. All right, good afternoon, and thanks a lot for coming. Um, today's obviously a um, sad and yet a happy day for the city of Cleveland and the Cleveland Browns as we announce the official retirement of Joe Thomas. And Hugh's sitting there looking at me like, what in the world could be happy about this? And that's a fair statement. Um, but I think today it's important to begin to celebrate what Joe Thomas accomplished in his career. And I feel very strongly that as recognized as he was during his career, people will really begin to appreciate what he accomplished in his 10 plus years with the Cleveland Browns, both on and off the field. And it really is truly remarkable. I think most everybody knows the story. Uh, Joe was the third pick in the 2007 draft uh, and went on to play 167 consecutive games 10,363 snaps. And if you just think about that, 10 plus years without not only missing a game, but without missing a snap, that's a phenomenal record. And not only did Joe play a lot and play frequently, he played exceptionally well. Listen to this one statistic. He was selected to 10 straight Pro Bowls. In the history of the NFL, only five other people have accomplished that and only and none of them was alignment, okay? None of them was alignment. The Cleveland Browns have had nine, uh, two members uh, of its football team make nine Pro Bowls, and they're both in the Hall of Fame, Jim Brown and Lou Groza. And so I think that shows you the kind of stature that Joe has achieved. And that's why I think today is a day that we really begin celebrating Joe Thomas's career We'll celebrate it again uh, this year at one of our games when the number 10,363 is inducted into our ring of honor. And five years from now, all of us in this room will make the trek down to Canton where I feel very, very certain that Joe will be inducted as a first ballot Hall of Famer into a position he richly deserves along with the other greats of the game. As good as has been on the field, has been equally good off the field. He's a three-time nominee for the Walter Payton Award, was a finalist in 2012. Um, he's been the Browns nominee for Salute to Service. He and Annie have been active in numerous good causes in Northeast Ohio and the city of Cleveland. And I think most of all, Joe has represented the city of Cleveland, um, the Cleveland Browns and his family as a true pro. You never read anything bad about Joe Thomas. You never hear anything bad about Joe Thomas. He literally came to work every day and did his job, and went home every night and came back and did it again uh, for 10 years, 10 plus years. And Andy, we wanna thank you for all the support you put behind Joe and helping him be the man that he is today and for toughing it out for lots of uh, long games and for hanging in there with us and your three children. And uh, Joe, I, legend has it that 10 years ago when you were drafted, or I guess 11 years ago now, when you were drafted, you were fishing uh, out on the lake with your dad. Is that right? And there's a picture of you when you got the cell call, getting the cell call that you were drafted by the Browns and holding the fish. And knowing you, you probably still have the fishing rod. Is that right? <laughs> Absolutely said. However, as a small token of our appreciation, there'll be many more. Uh, we'd like to, John Dorsey and Hugh Jackson would like to present you. We want to go full circle and give you another fishing rod. I understand you're going back to Wisconsin in a week and a half that you can use to fish with. And it's appropriately embroidered with a fishing vest with a number 73 on it. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage one of the all-time greats of the NFL, a surefire future Hall of Famer, Joe Thomas. Thanks, Jimmy. You're a tall guy, but I'm a little taller here. Um, 
It's obviously a little bit of an emotional day for me. Um, I wanted to start out by saying thank you to everyone for attending today's press conference. It's always humbling when you get honored in the way that I'm being honored today. And when you see all these busy people taking time out of their day to come and watch what is, uh, it's kind of like that pep rally that you had in high school, you know, where you're excited about it because you get to miss that pop quiz and math class. But other than that, you just hope that you get out in time to catch the buses. So don't worry, I'll get you guys out in time to catch your buses this afternoon. But most of all, I just wanted to say that I'm grateful for everyone for coming today and to all the folks that were out here that had a big hand in me being able to stand up on this stage today and be proud of all the things that I've done in my 11 year career. Um, I hope I'm able to control my tears a little bit, but in case I don't, I wanted to make sure everyone understands that this is a day for me to celebrate and also to give thanks. So um, hopefully everyone enjoys the day as much as I know I am. Um, this off season, there was a lot of people that reached out to me when they heard I was considering retirement. Um, they had an opportunity to talk to me and give their input. And uh, one of the guys that talked to me was actually Kyle Shanahan. And uh, he put together a 32 point slide presentation on PowerPoint telling me why I need to come back. Um, unfortunately, that didn't work. Ray Farmer tried to text me, um, but it was during a game. And unfortunately, he was suspended for that. Um, Eric Mangini wanted to reach out to me because I had a couple years with him and he thought it was important to hear a few things from him, but uh, unfortunately he said I was going to have to ride eight hours with him on a bus to Connecticut if I wanted to hear all about it, so I turned that down. Um, Brandon Whedon still has my phone number somehow after uh, all these years, and he tried to call me, but he ended up still being stuck under that giant American flag, uh, so he didn't get any reception. Um, Sashi tried to trade some information with me uh, about my retirement, but unfortunately it, it didn't get in in time. Um, Johnny tried to call me from the club, but his money phone apparently didn't have very good service. And uh, in the end, we all know that the reason I retired was because of Robert Griffin III. It was definitely his fault. Seriously, though, I know that I joke a little bit and try to have fun with things. Um, I've had a lot of outstanding memories of my 11 years in Cleveland. Um, one memory, if you will please allow me to stroll down memory lane a little bit, is something that I'll never forget, and that's uh, after the biggest road comeback in NFL history, dancing in the locker room in Tennessee with myself and our quarterback at the time, Brian Hoyer, and uh, me being able to prove to everyone once and for all that myself, the Vanilla Volcano, was a better dancer than Brian Hoyer. That was a big moment in my career. Um, one moment I'll never forget is being in Baltimore on the road. I was a young player at the time, and Phil Dawson kicks a field goal to try to tie it to go into overtime. And it looked like it had bounced off the goalpost and bounced out, um, but everyone went in the locker room. We thought the game was over. We thought we'd lost, and the refs actually reviewed it. They saw that the ball had hit something called a stanchion, which is something that I didn't even know what it was until that moment. And they brought everyone back on the field. We ended up going into overtime and winning that game. That's a moment that will be burned in my memory forever. And I think it actually might be the only time that I won in Baltimore during my career. Um, of course, another moment I'll never forget is uh, the Rob Chudzinski era. Both those days were outstanding. Um, of course, a lot of great team records when I was here. Jerome Harrison set the rushing record against Kansas City. That was one of the most fun games I was ever able to play in. I think we had almost 300 yards rushing and a couple kick return touchdowns by Josh Cribbs. And just the feeling of being able to go out there, play after play, and impose your will on a defense to be able to continue to run the ball the way we wanted, that was a lot of fun. That was something that I'll never forget. Um, of course, Josh McCown a couple years ago set a great passing record for the Browns. Josh Gordon set a receiving record for uh, yards, in a uh, yards receiving in a season, and he did it in only 12 games. I'm proud to be a part of that. Um, in 2009, we won four games in a row at the end of the season after starting one and 11. Sort of uh, a small milestone for us, but I think it was a, a team record at the time. And it was really fun to see that team come together towards the end of that season and put together that winning streak. Um, of course, something I'll tell maybe my kids someday is uh, 
when I got to 10,000 straight snaps and LeBron James tweeted at me. And then, of course, when I retired, he tweeted at me again. And um, I'd like to tweet back at him someday when he retires. But hopefully that's not for a long time because I still love watching him play. Um, another highlight was during training camp, we always have swimming races in the pool. And I was able to dominate my competition so, so much this season that they renamed the pool after me. It's the, now the Joe Thomas Natatorium. My son liked that one. In 2007, we went 4-0 in the preseason and were declared preseason world champions. That's going to be on my grave. But the reality is, I just felt that, for me, the time was right to retire because I knew that Hugh was going to make the rest of the team jump in the lake with him this year, and I didn't think I'd be able to handle that. I'm not as tough as I used to be. But I think it's appropriate after 11 great seasons um, that I thank a lot of people. And please bear with me. There's a lot of people that really deserve thanking, and I want to make sure I can try to cover most of them. Um, first and foremost, somebody that I really want to thank because I know for sure my career wouldn't be the same without her is obviously my amazing wife, Annie. She's been my rock since day one, and I can never repay her for those long games with her fingernails in her mouth, worried not exactly if I do my job, but just hoping that I didn't get hurt. And uh, I appreciate that so much. Um, of course, my children, my three kids are fantastic. Being able to come home after a tough day at work or a tough uh, game, as we've had a few of those, was so much better when you're able to see their face and instantly see them light up. And they make you really put everything in perspective. Um, Got to thank my parents, Eric and Sally, the way they raised me, the core principles that they instilled in me. Those are things that I still carry with me to this day. Um, other family, my friends, three friends that I really want to specifically mention on this day that are really important to me. Um, Luke Holman, Steve Johnson, and Ben Strickland, they're three guys that I grew up with when I was a kid. One of them, sadly, is not with us anymore, but I know that he's listening to this from somewhere in heaven, and I think it's important that I mention their names because um, up until that point in my, my life, before I met those kids, I really wasn't somebody that uh, was too big into sports, but once I met them and started playing basketball and football and track and baseball with them, um, they showed me a love of sports. They instilled in me what it means to have passion and focus on a single goal on the athletic field. And I think they were as integral a part of my career as anybody that I'd met since then. Um, so without meeting them in grade school, I'm sure I would probably be stuck being an intern for Simon Galan. And Lord knows I wouldn't wish that on anybody. <laughs> of course, something that happened recently that I'm very proud of and very excited about because I think I've, I've gotten everybody in the city some days off um, is the city of Cleveland who's decided to name 7-3-2018 as a uh, global holiday in my honor. That's very, very awesome, and I'm very excited about it because now I get to celebrate two of the greatest days in history back-to-back, -back, one being July 4th and the other one, of course, now being another reason to party. Are you saying football? <laughs> uh, I got to thank my college coaches, of course, the great Barry Alvarez at Wisconsin, Brett Bielema, Paul Christ. Those were guys that took an 18-year-old freshman and a, a boy who really didn't know anything about the world or anything about hard work and turned me into the man that became ready to play in the NFL and start and make the pro in my rookie season. I've had a lot of great offensive line coaches in my career that had a huge impact and a tremendous impact I'm not only the person that I am, but also the player that I was on the field. Um, Jim Huber, Bob Palsik, Steve Marshall, Mike Sullivan, George Warhop, Andy Muller, the World War I General, George DeLeon, Hal Hunter, Mark Hudson, Bob Wiley. Not the Bob Wiley from What About Bob, of course. That's probably the one you know, but the real Bob Wiley right here. He's living in in-person back here. So thank you to you guys. Uh, my six head coaches, of course, Hugh Jackson, Romeo Cornell, Eric Mangini, Pat Shermer, Rob Chinzinski, Mike Pettin. Now, each one of those, I will, each one of those coaches are, have given me something on the field and in life that I'll definitely take with me for the rest of my life. And one thing that I learned from those coaches that I'll never forget, and it's something that I 
teach young kids about when I get the opportunity to speak to high school kids is there's three things in life and in football that if you can master and you can remember from time to time, you'll be able to be successful in that. It's be on time, pay attention, and work hard. If you can do those three things in life or on the football field, you have an opportunity to have great success. And I thank you guys for all those great lessons that I learned on the football field. The Haslams, the learners, my agent, Peter Schaefer, my GMs, Phil Savage, Georgia Kokinas, Tom Hecker, Joe Banner, Ray Farmer, Sashi Brown, John Dorsey, and all of the presidents and czars, and many people that used to walk around the building carrying briefcases that nobody knew what was inside of them. You guys are going to help make my book a New York Times bestseller, so I thank you guys. Of course, I need to thank Jenna, Renee, Brittany, and everybody in the Browns Community Relations Department. You guys are awesome. You, you made the player who had a desire to be able to give back to his community, able to do those things in a smooth and easy and fulfilling manner. And I don't know if I'll ever be able to meet anybody as wonderful as you guys and the things that you do for this city. Of course, the public relations staff that had more of a headache on their hands the longer my career went on. Peter John Baptiste, Dan Murphy, Rob McDermott, I know your name is McBurnett, but I figured I'd call you McDermott since I've been calling you that for six years. You guys definitely deserve a raise for having to put up with me. Oh, I gotta thank Billy Vegas. He helped turn my podcast, The Tomahawk Show, into the number one show on iTunes. Thanks for remembering all those terrible times that you had in Cleveland. Uh, Brad Mellon, Jeff Enderhees, Jimmy Mack, and everyone in the equipment room. You guys somehow were able to find pants baggy enough for me. And I will leave you with this. Ninjas wear baggy pants, and they're the most nimble and quick creatures on the face of the earth. So any football players out there, I see a couple, you definitely want to wear baggy pants. Don't, don't buy into the hype with the tight pants. Uh, somebody else I need to thank that I'm sure nobody thought of was uh, Vincent Painter. He's a guy that didn't play a lot here in Cleveland, but he tried to sub me out in the middle of my streak and I wouldn't have the 10,363 consecutive snaps if he would not have listened to me when I cussed him out on the field and sent him back to the sidelines to continue my streak. Of course, there's a lot of amazing teammates that I've had over my career, and just a few that I really want to name because I think they really deserve it. Uh, Alex Mack, Jason Pinkston, Mitchell Schwartz, John Greco, Hank Fraley, Eric Steinbach, Joel Batonio, those were guys that grinded with me on a daily basis. They were in the trenches with me. They went through the tough times in training camp in August when it's 95 degrees. They were by my side in the middle of December in snowstorms. In the hard times when you're losing, in the great times when you're winning, those are your buddies. And those will be the, my friends until the day that I die. Of course, I also have to thank all of my teammates from Pee Wee through high school, through college, and into the pros. Uh, the great strength staffs that I was able to work with. Of course, my lifting partner, Evan Marcus, back there. He's a guy that I've really come to know and enjoy in my last few years in the NFL. Rob Pavlis, Chad Bogart, and the video crews that I've had. Of course, I still don't know how to run a Microsoft Surface after 11 years, but somehow I was able to survive. And uh, I think I really want to just thank you so much for helping me, even though I'm sort of technical technologically uh, illiterate. Of course, the staff of the Joe Thomas Hour. Who can say that that wasn't the best two minutes of their life? Joe Sheehan and their medical staff deserve a big thank you. You guys were the backbone of me being able to reach 10,363 consecutive snaps, all while putting together an impressive streak of almost zero consecutive snaps in practice in the last three or four years. Of course, got to say thank you and a big shout out to the beat writers, the guys that follow the team on a daily basis. Mary Kay, Tony, Jeff, Pat, Scott, Tom, Nate, Steve, Gribble, Fred, Daryl, Jim, and Doug. Our locker room conversations were often the highlight of my day towards the end of my career. And I thank you so much for always covering myself and my team and my career in a fair and honest manner. One thing I do need to say to Jeff Shadell, where is he? He's not here. Well, he must be at Mission Barbecue because I got a memo that said he had a little bit of barbecue sauce on his face still. <laughs> I got to say thank you, of course, to all the staff with the Browns that I haven't mentioned yet. 
of course, the cafeteria workers. I, I still like to eat even today. I've lost a few pounds, but I still get a smile on my face every time I walk into that fantastic cafeteria. Chris Powell and the grounds crew, John Frayne, Ken Rundle, and the security guys, Ron Brewer, Aaron Shea, and player engagement, Simon, the one-man army, and his crew. I know I don't think Simon was able to be here today because he was trying to win the Super Bowl today, um, but hopefully we can relay the message of thanks. Uh, the marketing staff, the sales team, and then everyone who does the things behind the scenes to put the Cleveland Browns out there on Sundays that don't get the recognition that they, they definitely deserve. Um, lastly, I think it's important that I mention a thanks to all the fans. You guys were the ones that took me in as one of your own. The grit, passion, toughness, and determination that you display on a daily basis is an inspiration for myself and for all of my teammates and all the people that wear Cleveland across their chest. You guys taught me what it means to be a Clevelander. Playing in front of the greatest fans in the NFL is easily the greatest honor that I've had in my 11-year career. I hope I was able to make you guys proud in the way that I was always proud when I told people boldly that I am a Cleveland Brown. The excitement I had for my team and my city never wavered, no matter what the circumstances. So it is with all of this that I must say goodbye. All right, doing good, I'm almost there. <laughs> um, goodbye, not because I'm retiring, but because I'm merely changing jobs. From being your left tackle to being the number one fan of the Cleveland Browns. Thank you. Encore? All right, didn't think so. All right, I guess we have some time for some questions. And um, before we get to questions, uh, Pat McMahon from ESPN has, a, has announced an announcement. All right, great. Uh, Peter was supposed to make this, so he kind of put me on the spot, but I'll say it anyway on behalf of the pro football writers locally, all of us who are here. Uh, we appreciate your kind words. Uh, we give a player of the year award every year, as you know. And from this day forward, that award will be called the Joe Thomas oh. Award. And it's just. Thank you, guys. That means a lot. It's a way to recognize what you've achieved and to carry it forward. Uh, we talked about that or a gift, and none of us really wanted to spend <laughs> the money. So. Thanks, guys. Questions? What's next? Yeah, right. Good question. Um, What's next? I'm not sure. I, I think there's a few opportunities that I'm exploring right now. I'm keeping all my doors open and um, going to look for something that's the right fit for me and my family. I know part of the part of the things that I'm excited about with this retirement. Obviously, I'm really sad that I'm done with playing football, but I'm really excited to be able to spend more time with my family. So whatever happens in the next phase of my life, I'm really looking forward to finding something that will fit with what I hope to expect um, with my family life. Joe, I have a question for you. Uh, you went into a great bit of detail on your podcast with Hawk about how difficult it was for you the last couple of years mm -hmm. to get ready each and every mm -hmm. week to be mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. on Sunday. He made the Ferrari um, <laughs> connotation, which was pretty cool. I don't know I if thought. I'm a Ferrari, maybe well, a beat-up truck, like maybe. Mater on that uh, kids show cars. <laughs> a nice Packard or something. <laughs> well, Joe, how difficult was it to get ready each week? And even if you had not injured your tricep, was there a possibility that you might not mm -hmm. still be playing football, mm -hmm. even looking ahead to next year? Mm -hmm. Well, I think part of the thought process that went into the decision to retire was just reflecting on where I was during the season last year and as the games got closer to the game that I hurt my tricep, um, I was feeling like I was in tough shape physically, uh, my knee specifically, and I was concerned that I wasn't going to make it through the season. Um, 
not only that, but I was concerned even if I was able to make it that my performance was going to drop significantly because of um, what I had to go through to try to get the knee ready on Sunday. And then sometimes it wasn't really feeling all that ready. Um, so definitely um, there was difficulty, especially the, as my career wore on, getting that uh, body and specifically the knee ready for Sundays. Hey, Joe, besides being the number one fan, what do you see your role? <laughs> what do you see your role with the organization being yeah. moving forward? Yeah, I'm not sure yet. I think um, I mentioned, you know, my love and passion for this organization. And so hopefully there's uh, a future with the team. I know that uh, hopefully Jimmy and Dee and I will be able to talk about that a little bit this off season and try to, you know, figure something out. But um, I think that's the discussion that's going to happen down the road. Hey, Joe, uh, you know, since Cleveland really has adopted you as, as one of their own, uh, can you see yourself actually making this your home and living here year-round at some point? Yeah, we, we love it here in Cleveland. The plan right now is is not to live here year-round. My uh, parents, my wife's parents, all of our families are in um, Wisconsin. And as you can see, my kids are a handful, so we need as many babysitters as possible. <laughs> um, so I... Like I said, I'm I'm looking to take just kind of a year to see where everything's at. I think um, talking to some other players that have retired, talking with the NFLPA and and thinking about that process, it takes guys about a year, they say, usually to sort of figure out where their life is and where their next passion is going to be. So um, I'm ready to take a little bit of time to kind of figure that out. Hey, Joe, uh, out of everything that, you know, you kind of said in your opening and so many great memories, what do you think you'll miss most? Well, that's an easy one. The thing I'll miss most is right behind me in the locker room with all those guys. I think the environment that you have in the locker room, the teasing of each other, the fun, the daily conversations, the intellectual conversations, the arguments, um, those are all things that... I don't think you can find anywhere else. That brotherhood that you get in the locker room is is unique to football as a game and sports as a whole, but it's something that is not created anywhere else. And so I think um, that being so much a part of my life for so long is easily the thing that I'll miss the most, and it'll be the hardest to replicate in retirement. Joe, congratulations on your career and being the first player to ever thank the media for anything. <laughs> we appreciate it. Um, we were all here the day you were drafted, mm -hmm. and uh, the thing that stuck in everyone's mind was you saying you, your goal is to make the Hall of Fame. You did thought you, I was lying, didn't you? Not, well, did you really believe it at the time? Uh, I mean, were you that sure uh -huh. of yourself at that point in your career? <clears throat> I'm not sure I was ready to write myself into the Hall of Fame, but I definitely knew that that was my goal. That was... Um, what I was going to focus on from day one. And now that was the big goal. Obviously, you're not going to make the Hall of Fame in one year, but um, I think it was important for me to come into my career as a rookie and keep my mouth shut, my eyes open, of course, like any good rookie, but also keep the sights high. I wanted to make sure my goals were as high as they possibly could be so that if for some reason I fell a little bit short, at least I could always say that it, I shot for the best. I, want, I tried to be the greatest. I gave it my all. I, I did everything I possibly could, and I never s sold myself short. Since you have your podcast and you have... It's very so popular. <laughs> Number one on iTunes, in case you're wondering. There you go. There's your plug. Uh, <laughs> since you have done some uh, analyst work and since you're the guy who... Guaranteed us Brock Osweiler would start in the Browns. Yeah, I know a sign. lot about football. <laughs> Cousins, is, I mean, do you have any thoughts on the draft? Or uh? Yeah. <laughs> uh, the Browns are going to get some awesome football players. That's my thoughts. Uh, no, it'll be interesting. I, I think um, we've got an outstanding general manager and John Dorsey. And so I'm excited to watch the time from now through the draft to see what moves he makes and see what players he decides to select. Um, but I think... Clearly, we're in an outstanding position where at one and four, no matter what happens, we're going to get some really good football players added to this team. Joe, if you could design the perfect post-football career for yourself, 
what what would your title be? What would your work life look like? Ooh. Do they have any jobs where you don't show up but you get paid a lot of money? <laughs> I want that one. <laughs> Um, no, good question. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I definitely want to stay around the game. I, I think the longer you play football, the more it becomes a part of who you are. The passion um, somehow gets greater. And if you would have told me as a rookie that I would love football and the game and playing it and everything about it more now than even when I was in high school or even in middle school, I probably would have said you're lying. But it really becomes who you are, and it becomes so much a part of your life. I think that's why so many guys struggle with the transition from player to post-career. Um, and so, I, I don't know, I, I think a little bit of coaching. I, I respect the heck out of these coaches because there's no way I could spend the amount of time that they do <laughs> as a coach. But I definitely like to try to stay around the game, coaching players individually, maybe do some broadcast work, um, do a few things with the team here. Um, you know, I, I want to be, even though I won't be on the field, somebody that can be a positive representation for the Cleveland Browns and, and help them in any way I can um, without being on the field. So I don't know what that position is going to look like yet, but hopefully we can do something and I can still be a part of the game and be a part of this team. So what you're saying is that you want to be Doug Deacon. Yeah. Now, I don't think Doug's here today, but uh, I, I definitely want to be Doug Deacon. If, if you can uh, map out the perfect life, it would be Doug Deacon's and the perfect mustache. Hey, Joe, as your uh, career went on here, you became more outspoken, and we learned your sense of humor more and more. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, what happened there? And... <laughs> And, and how does that kind of um, relate to your interest in media work and kind of, you know, mm -hmm. some, some of the auditions you've been mm -hmm. doing and, and mm -hmm. what you, you you see for yourself, in, you know, from, from that end of the business? I got good advice when I was a rookie to keep your mouth shut and keep your eyes open. And so that's what I did. And, and early on in my career, I had uh, Eric Mangini, Romeo Cornell. They came from... Bill Belichick, Bill Parcells. Um, so we, we spent a lot of time in those meeting rooms talking about how not to talk to you guys. So I did not want to get in trouble for talking too much to the media. Um, but as your career wears on and you, you feel more comfortable, I think, in front of a microphone, in front of a camera, and you start to see that there is a, a large positive opportunity there for you to kind of get your message out there to the fans, to be able to talk directly to the fans through the media. And I just started embracing that and started opening up a little bit more and showing my personality a little bit more. And um, I think a big part of that was doing some of the silly shows with the Browns, some of the Joe Thomas hour, some of the um, sort of off the field type interviews that I did with um, the Browns TV and radio stuff, and I enjoyed it, and I think the, the feedback was okay at least, and so I guess I kept going a little bit. <laughs> so we'll see. I don't know if that's going to parlay into a broadcast gig or not, but um, I guess we'll find out. Hey, Joe, I think you thanked every former GM, coach, and quarterback. Uh, <laughs> I guess I? the biggest question is who gets to introduce you in Canton? <laughs> I honestly haven't thought about that yet. <laughs> Hopefully in five years or so, I'll be able to think about that a little more. Hey, Joe, in the last week after all the tributes and congratulations have come in, anything stand out about all those? Um, I think as a lineman, you always have this uh, perception of yourself as a mushroom. You know, you're the guy that's over in the corner that they keep in the dark room and they throw crap on it and they expect good things to happen and you you just kind of you, you just don't think of yourself as anybody that important and uh over the last week to hear all these actually important people like LeBron and other people that are really important uh send congratulations and talk about what you've meant to them and I got so many messages on Twitter and through text messages and emails from people that I played with people that we're already in the NFL now that were maybe in high school or middle school when I started playing, and they, they were talking about how they looked up to me, the way I played, the way I carried myself. Um, and that meant a lot to me. I mean, guys that are Pro Bowl tackles that I think are the next Hall of Fame offensive linemen in the game right now, sending me messages, calling me, telling me what I meant to their career and, and 
Um, those were things that I, you never think about. And to read those things, I can tell you, I, I went through a lot of boxes of Kleenex the last week. <laughs> Joe, seriously, though, uh, with the... <laughs> Sorry, I can't the, do that. <laughs> the Pro Bowls, the snap streaks, the game streaks, that, who would you say had the biggest impact on your 11-year career? Um, coach or player or either? I think um, probably the person, I'll give you two people. Um, George Warhop had a big impact on my career as a player. He had me for like seven years as a player. He's an outstanding offensive line coach. He's um, unrelenting. He teaches really exceptional technique. He's a, a tough but fair coach. And I think I had him from my third year through my like eighth year maybe or something like that. I mean, I had him for the longest stretch of my career. And I definitely give him a lot of credit for helping me see the game the way I do and turning me into the offensive lineman that um, I stepped off the field as last year. Um, you know, I felt like I, I was a decent player before he showed up. I made a couple of Pro Bowls, but I think he helped me take my game to the next level. He showed me that uh, where I was it was not good enough because the standard was even better. So I give him a lot of credit. And then Alex Mack, uh, another longtime teammate, a great friend. Um, he was younger than me, but I think just watching him practice and um, watching him prepare and just the friendships and the good times that we had, I think he was a guy that probably had a, another huge impact on my career. Thank you guys.